So my name is Sam Rowe, I'm CEO of Ignition as Thomas said and um, today I'd just like to talk a little bit about ideas, trends <laughs> and innovations for delivering sustainable events. So just to explain a little bit um, about the premise of where I'm coming from with this presentation, um, Ignition is a global exhibitions, events and experiences company and we deliver events, sustainable events, all around the world hundreds of them per year for our clients, which range from corporate clients right through to small local southwest businesses. Um, and today I'd really just like to tell you a little bit about our story and how we've been successful by putting sustainability at the heart of what we do and how we still continue to try and convince people that actually being sustainable is a good thing, that we can all do a bit more and actually it benefits everybody. So how do we start out? So we came from very humble beginnings, so we literally had nothing. Um, Twelve years ago when we started out there was a handful of us and we kindly borrowed an aircraft hangar from a very good friend of ours um, and we worked out of there for six months but we had nothing else, no setup, nothing at all. But what we did have was a huge ambition to do the right thing and more than anything we wanted to combat this. So that that you can see there is a clip from the aftermath of a convention at the Shanghai Convention Centre only last year. And believe me, I have photos of the inside of the hall and it was just as bad. And I hope you would all agree that that's pretty horrific to see in today's world. Um, so we're trying to do our bit and you can imagine that with this kind of scale of waste that is no easy journey. Um, but we're getting there and we have seen some really positive things from the work that we're doing. So, as part of our journey to being a sustainable company, we thought it would be great to be accredited with ISO 2012-1, which is the standard for sustainable events. So this standard came out of the London Olympics, um, of which we were part of the steering group that were developing this standard. Um, the Olympics was very focused on sustainability, and in fact they had a zero waste approach, and that was the first Olympics of its kind like that. Um, and we were, as Thomas said, eventually the first company to be accredited with that. Um, we wanted to walk the walk, we didn't want to talk the talk, we just wanted to get people to listen to us, really stand up and hear what we had to say about it. And, you know, where we are in the events world, we're not great. You know, there are companies doing a bit, but as you can see from that kind of scale of waste, it's still a real big problem for us. So ultimately, what we wanted to become was advocates of sustainability. And finally, last December, after 12 years of dedication, passion from our team, commitment to our cause, we were finally recognised for our contribution to sustainability in our sector. And we were awarded the best eco supplier um, in December last year at the EN Elite Awards, which are specific to the exhibition and event industry. Um, you'll also see we did win best employer as well, but that's a whole other story. Although I do believe that actually because of what we do, we do retain our talent and our great people because we've got people that really care about what they do. So really that's why I'm here today is to tell you about you know, what we're doing in sustainability, the state of the event sector, where we are and what we can all do. So I'm going to talk through some examples, some research, things are going on in the world and really then some just practical tips, some of which I'm sure you all do and some of the things that we just really don't think about sometimes. So what does sustainability in business really mean? So sustainability is much more than just about the planet. Of course, the planet and the world around us is really, really important. Um, but sustainability is so much more. It's about people. It's about your team, their well-being. It's about your clients, their aspirations and what they're trying to do. And then ultimately, it's about the security and the longevity of your business. So, just a few points on, on where we are with sustainability. So, sustainability is on the strategic agenda to stay, for sure. You only have to look at the recent World Economic Forum, and it was a topic of huge debate, very high on the agenda for lots of different types of sectors and businesses. 
The build and burn culture of the event and exhibition industry has to stop. Uh, frankly, it's horrific and we have to do something about it. And I do believe that a more positive industry can emerge if we all work together to do that. Uh, we are making progress. I mean, we have clients that come to us now asking about, oh, no, we need to be really green. We need to be more sustainable. How do we do it? And, and you know, 12 years ago, clients weren't asking that. They just wanted to build stuff, hold events, do meetings around the world. And they really didn't give a second thought to what damage they were doing to the environment. Um, lots of companies, as you know now, have corporate social responsibility policies, and they are actually measuring themselves. And we actually do a lot of measurement on behalf of our clients now to understand the impact of their program of events for a year. I believe education is still key, and whether that's your internal teams or your clients, we have had to educate some of our clients that came from nowhere on a scale of sustainability. They really did nothing, and they didn't even see the point of it, but we've had to educate them, and that takes a long time. Hopefully, clips like the Shanghai Convention Centre really shows people what, you know, what state we're in. Um, and it makes good business sense. So sustainability can provide significant cost savings for businesses and for clients, and it also increases long-term client loyalty. So for me, some of our clients have been with us since day one, and that is because we offer them a sustainable solution. They're not building things, holding events, throwing stuff away. They invest in things, and over the long term, they benefit from that. And we, as a business, benefit from the trust of those companies to work with them and do the right thing. And sustainable can also, uh, can also be beautiful. There's a lot of debate about this, whether if you build something modular or something that you need to reuse, it can't be beautiful. Well, it can, and I will show you some examples. There are also many accreditations now and awards for sustainability in our sector, so you can get recognition for the good that you're doing. And it's good, you know, you get awareness, people know what you're doing. So ultimately, we all need to collaborate to facilitate, facilitate cultural change and responsibility lies with the entire supply chain. So if you are an event manager or a venue or a supplier, you will know that any single event has a lot of people involved and everybody in that supply chain has to work together towards sustainability. Change also always starts with culture, so that's the bit that we're trying to shift, is the mindset of people and how they think about delivering events and doing it differently, not just doing the same old thing that you've done year on year. Think differently, do your research and find other ways of doing things. So from designers and material use, venues and energy use, transport, carbon emissions to food waste and the horrendous food bank crisis that we here in the UK face right now, we can, together, make a positive impact. Okay, so how are we actually going to do this? I've talked a bit about the state of where we are. So we're calling it the virtuous circle and the things that we need to do to work together. And I just want to pick out some of the main factors when you're running events. So we're not going to cover everything because we could talk about sustainability for a long time and there are lots of things that impact it. But just some of the big hitters. So I'm sure there are some venues, there are definitely lots of venues here today and hopefully some in the audience, so a venue is a big thing when it comes to an event. Your selection of a venue is key you know, to some of the success of the event. And they also have a big factor in the sustainability of an event. So how does your venue fare? I mean, what is the sustainability policy for the venue you're selecting? What kind of lighting do they use? Have they invested in being more sustainable? There are lots of accreditations that buildings and venues can get now, and I've just listed a few here. There's BREAM, which is the uh, Environmental Assessment Method, LEED, which is Energy and Environmental Design, and then there's Green Tourism, Business Schemes. I mean, there's lots out there, so really do your research and understand what your venues are doing to help you to be more sustainable in an event. Um, so just to bring this to a bit sort of a, a local focus, Bristol's a great city in terms of sustainability. So we were the green city in 2015, green capital in 2015. It was England's first cycling city, and it's also home to the likes of the, so the Soil Association and the Sustrans. I mean, it does have some fantastic local venues. Of course, we have We The Curious here today, um, and we're here. And We The Curious are doing a lot. Um, they've got solar array on the uh, roof, which is... I think it's bigger than two tennis courts. They're installing, am I correct? Yes, yes. Yeah. they're installing LED lighting all around the site. In fact, they've got a team, and I think we've got one of the team members here today, across the departments who are all working together to be more sustainable. 
Um, the Mercure Holland has Hotel and Create Centre are also um, GTBS accredited, which is the Green Tourism Business Scheme, and they have the Gold Award, which is the highest you can get. And I think it's described as inspirational in what they're trying to do to be more sustainable, how they use water, the energy, the regeneration, what they're trying to do. Philwood Green Business Park here. This is just an example of a, a, a fantastic building. It could be used as a venue for, for small workshops and things, but what they are doing is leading the field in the regeneration of Bristol in this particular area. Um, they set out with an ambition to reduce CO2 by 40%, which was saving an estimated 46 tonnes of CO2 annually, which is equivalent to 276 double-decker buses. I mean, they have electric, electrical vehicle charging points, they have a, a seed roof, so all sorts of stuff going on there, so really fantastic place. And then my last example of a, a venue is the Eden Project. And really, the Eden Project, for a lot of people, epitomises sustainability. They do an awful lot. Um, they even teach a sustainable module on an MSC. Uh, they do what they do for their local community. They've invested, well, they've put back £1.9 billion into the Cornish economy since they started. So for me, that says that actually sustainability is a good business way of doing things. Um, so, yeah, they do so much, um, and in the words of Tim Smith, who was co-founder of the Eden Project, who I was fortunate enough to hear at a conference once, this is what he said. Sustainability is not about sandals and nut cutlets. It's about good business practice and the citizenship values of the future. So, really, I think they've proven that at the Eden Project, and it's a fantastic venue as well. So my advice really is let venues know that sustainability is not only a concern for your event, but it's also a criterion of your selection process. That just gets them to help kind of you know think about what they're doing as well. I mean, venues are in competition with one another, let's face it. So they all want to do their best. So another topic I wanted to touch on was waste, which of course is a huge thing. And you saw from my clip here that actually it's pretty bad and we're in a, in a bad place. So just some advice on becoming, you know, we'd love to have zero landfill. It would be the ultimate kind of holy grail for us. But just little bits that we can do to re reduce waste at an event. I would say when it comes to anything, when you're building anything, let's think about reuse, modularity and recycling. So let's design things that are going to last for numerous events. Don't build one-offs. But if you have to build something very specific, because, you know, at the end of the day, clients want things, new marketing managers come in, they want to make their splash, they have a new brand, and they want to do stuff, that's okay, but then repurpose it to something else. We recently did a project for Google in the US, and the exhibition stand that we built for them was then transferred to their head office, and it's part of it is on display in their foyer for their uh, employees, so you can reuse things. But, of course, that has to be considered from the start when anybody's designing it. And you can still be creative. So this just gives you a couple of examples of uh, sustainability from a repurposing reusability perspective. So this stand here is completely reusable. None of this ever goes into landfill. It doesn't contribute to that state that you saw outside the Shanghai Convention Center. It's all reusable. It can be any format. And I think you would agree, it still looks good. You know, it doesn't look cheap and it doesn't look like it's gonna fall down. Um, another example here, and this kit really is like Lego, and you can reformat it into any shape, any size. It goes all over the world. It comes back to our warehouse. We look after it. This kit here is about eight years old, and there's nothing wrong with it, and we reuse it, reuse it, reuse it. A good example of repurposing here. So Vital Baby, what they actually did, um, a child and baby show, was they used their own product to create some of the walls. So again, just thinking in a different way and repurposing something. And actually, it created a great attractor for their stand and was promoting their product. Um, so this here, this is a really interesting case study that we've used, we've used within our company. So Frankie Colab, who are based in Los Angeles, designed a completely flexible kit. So you can see in the top right there, it starts off as a stair, but it can actually transform into a stage, um, an event space, a retail kit, and you can all, it can always look fresh, it can always look different, but it's completely modular, and you could take it into any kind of space. So these are the kind of things that people are doing in the world. There's lots of innovation going on in our sector, and a lot that we actually just don't know about. 
So just in terms of innovation, I just wanted to show you something. You're probably going to wonder why on earth I'm showing this, but this is about kind of changing the mindset, shifting the mindset of people to thinking about how they use things. So this is about TV. Um, this is from CES in Las Vegas where we go um, as our research for innovation and what's going on in the tech world. And it's about a TV and how you can use a TV more than just as a TV. This might be the TV of CES 2019. This is LG's rollable 4K signature OLED TV-R. I know it's a mouthful, but it's beautiful. Here in Las Vegas, we're seeing a lot of TVs with bigger and bigger screens, 75 inches, 88 inches and above. And there's a ton of hype about 8K, even though there's not any 8K content to watch anywhere. But here's the thing. There are people who don't love having a big black rectangle be the centerpiece of their living room. Lots of folks don't have a TV at all. We've seen with our phones this desire to spend less time in front of screens. Now that's translating to our TVs. Companies have been making TVs that blend better into our homes. You've seen this with Samsung and its frame TV, which looks like a picture frame and shows museum artwork whenever you're not watching it. Samsung also has the Serif TV, which looks just like a piece of furniture and even has built-in shelves. In a way, this new rollable TV from LG is the pinnacle of that philosophy. When it ships this spring, for a lot of money, let's be clear, you can have a beautiful TV that just tucks away once you don't need it. So really, that's a great example of just thinking differently about one particular product, a TV, how it can be a piece of furniture, a piece of art, it can play things, you can watch it, you can tuck it away. And actually, in an events world, to have something rollable that you can carry around with you that for example, a sales rep could use, is a great thing. Yes, it's unaffordable right now, but this is where we're going. So plastic, clearly a big subject on the world agenda right now. Um, and really what we should be aiming for is to ban any single-use plastic in the event sector, but we're a long way from that. So estimates suggest that by 2015, in terms of weight, there could be more plastic than fish in our oceans. And I'm sure you've all seen this because last year there was a lot about this on the news. So I just want to touch on plastic and what we can try and do to be better. So in the event sector, plastic is used in so many things, but I just picked one thing, which is ticketing and badging. You know, it's been great here today that um, Meet Southwest are not, you know, giving out lanyards. We're just bringing our own. So that's a great start. But you think about all the plastic and all the lanyards that we've had over the years for badges, you know, which everybody wants to have a badge for one reason or another, but it's too much and we just need to get rid of the plastic side of it. So really, if you can't go digital, because lots of people are going digital, but it's difficult to go completely digital in ticketing and badging, for example, there are lots of other options out there. They're not all ready by any means, but we're on the way to getting them to work. So I just want to show you a couple of examples, you know, including kelp and algae, cellulose and sugarcane, and how we can have renewable plant-based plastics to provide a more environmentally responsible option. So these are a couple of fantastic, very innovative businesses that are trying to change the face of plastic. Um, so this is Paptic, it's a Finnish brand, and they won the bio-based product of the year 2017 in Europe for its innovative wood fibre-based paper, which provides an alternative plastic packaging and plastic bags. Um, so this can actually already be used in plastic machinery. So it's a great start. Um, algae and seaweed is also being explored as a substitute to plastic. And this particular product here, they're looking at um, using it for injection moulding plastic. So again, highly innovative, probably not doing badging for events right now, but they could do in the future. And the next one may be a step too far for most of us, I would say, at this point in time. But, as, you know, we take inspiration from other sectors and Swedish train operator SJ uses microchips for tickets and train tickets. So, you know, imagine asking any delegate to have a microchip put in them to come to an event. Yeah, I'm pretty sure most people would say no. However, I mean, 2,000 Swedes have a population of just under 10 million already have microchips. Those that work in the tech sector are really into it. Um, you know, I imagine in the future, with the way we're going, robots and all that stuff, that we will probably have chips sometime soon. But anyway, we can be inspired by it. Okay, so food and drink weight. I mean, food is always a hot topic at any event. You've got to get it right. You want it to be good. You know, there's a lot of pressure on caterers to be good at what they do. Um, and again, it's another big contributor from a plastic perspective. So what is good to know is that 
big players out there are trying to do their bit. I'm sure you all saw in the news last year the focus on plastic straws and how businesses are trying to get rid of them and stop using them because, again, they're contribu- contributing to what you saw in the sea. So good to know that Starbucks have introduced strawless recyclable lids to phase out plastic straws by 2020. It is still plastic, but it's recyclable, so it's better. Uh, pret a also has a plastic pledge. So they're trying to say that um, by 2025, they will sign up to a lot of things concerning plastic, ban single-use plastic, be recyclable, compostable, and help their people and their customers be more sustainable. Again, a couple of great inspirational companies who are trying to do this thing differently. So Lollyware, based in New York, they're looking to use seaweed, basically, to create straws, what would have been plastic straws. So it's edible, compostable, and marine degradable. Okay, I don't think they're for sale yet, and they're just starting out, but it could be a way to do something different. And actually, doing some of these things differently are what get you to stand out and get your customers to stand out at events. And this is a really interesting one. So researchers at Georgia Institute of Technology have used, and I have to read this, cellulose nanocrystals from trees and chitting from the cells of anthropods like crabs to make a flexible, transparent film. So it's a bit like cling film. And what this does actually is reduces the oxygen permeability by 67%, so it could actually increase the lifespan of the food. So a good thing. Um, And just the final thing on this, so it's good to know also Starbucks and McDonald's, two huge players in the world of waste, have joined forces to develop a worldwide recyclable or compostable solution to disposable cups. So the Next Gen Challenge invites innovators and suppliers to submit ideas and designs for single-use cups. We all know that what you know we used to think were disposable cups are not actually disposable, so a massive contributor to waste. So just think about the actual food that goes in those boxes and bags and cafeterias, whatever it is at an event. What can we do with that? Well, what we do... Um, is donate it. So, you know, we all know the tragedy of our rising food bank requirement here in the UK is is at an all-time high. We've got 40 million people living in poverty, 4.5 million of those are children. What can we do to help? So I think donating any leftover foods, whether that's the boxes that you get as delegates when you go to conferences or food that you have in, you know, hot food that you have in canteen, it can be donated. Um, You can give it to a a crisis or a shelter like charity you can even just take it out and give it to homeless people or you can donate it to food banks i see so much food left over at all these conferences we go to i'm sure we could do something good with that too and just in terms of leftover food there's a a couple of things going on in terms of innovation to reduce the food waste as well so if it can't be donated or eaten what can we do with it this product the waste master is being used by hotels so actually what this does is um, reduce and compress the amount of waste. So it reduces food waste volume by up to 80%. You can imagine hotels have a lot of food waste. I mean, they could go out and donate it as well, but obviously this is a more economical way of doing it for them. And there's just the final point on food and waste. So uh, we talk in, in our sector a lot about industrial symbiosis. So this is about taking the waste of one chain, part of the chain, and using that waste to create another product. There's a lot of it going on there. You can see in the fisheries industry, leftover shells are being used to create paints, and actually good paints that you can paint your home with, and they do stay in, and it's good quality stuff. So another example, Marks and Spencers and Adnams have teamed up, and they are using surplus bread crusts left over from M&S sandwiches to actually replace some of the malt in their brews. So just an interesting way of making sure we're not adding to waste. And then the final one on this is a great product, coffee pixels. So this is ideal. If you're at an event and you happen to be doing something like speaking, oh, okay, and um, you know, don't want to have any of those accidents where you spill a cup of, cup of coffee over yourself, this is actually a coffee bar. And this Latvian coffee company are creating edible coffee bars. So rather than have a drink, you can eat your coffee. And actually, the way that's produced creates 80% less waste than making a cup of coffee. Just interesting. Um, so just a bit of advice on this. Ban single plastic use. You know, that is the ultimate place that we want to be. We're not there yet, but let's work towards it. Even simple things. I'm sure some of you do this already, but just providing water fountains for delegates to fill their own bottles. Let's not give out the plastic bottles. Make delegates work harder. Uh, provide discounted hot drinks if people bring their own. I mean, some of the big coffee chains do it. You know, if you bring your own cup, they fill you up. 
Um, use recyclable packaging for food and at least seek alternative materials. Um, we can't change the world overnight and suddenly start doing all this, but we can do little bits step by step and then donate leftover foods. So the final big topic on this for me is travel and logistics. And you know, unfortunately, it's one of those things that's pretty unavoidable in the event world, especially if you're doing events that are outside of the UK, overseas, over, over the other side of the world. So it's a big part, and it clearly has a big environmental impact through the carbon emissions that are produced, but we can do something about it. Um, you know, we know that podcasts, webinars, virtual meetings, social networking, all of that has been suggested that it can replace meetings, events, exhibitions. And about four or five years ago, people were coming to us saying, we just want to do virtual exhibitions. We don't want to go to them anymore. We're just going to you know, stream in, have webcams, do all that stuff. Uh, well, that sounds great, but would that actually work and would it give you the same results? No. That value of face-to-face, -face, you know, the human-to-human -human interaction is really priceless in the world of networking and doing business. But we believe that you can do a bit of both. So we do a lot of virtual meetings, we do a lot of webinars, we also do a lot of exhibitions. But clients are moving towards now being more conscious of the events they go to, the exhibitions that they do. So they'll do a lot of, you know, they, they'll only send half of their team. Whereas, you know, 15 people used to go on a jolly to an event. They don't all go anymore. So, yeah, people are being more conscious. So for me, just on this, really, some advice is when you're traveling or shipping, only take the kit you need. Find people that pack things and load things really well. We believe we're experts in shipping and packing and how we build crates and how we send everything out. We just maximize everything we can on every truck we go out. Very different in America, where they only load at one level. So really, trucks go out half empty. Um, share loads on trucks, it's also cheaper. Um, you might have to wait a few more days extra, but that's okay. Wherever you can, store things locally. And if you have a, an, an event in you know, Amsterdam and then an event in Paris, just keep the stuff in Europe. Don't bring it back and send it back and send it back. I mean, it's just a waste of money and a waste of uh, energy. Uh, only travel when you need to and only use the crew or the people that you need to. Just don't be wasteful. Encourage the use of public transport, bikes, walking, cycle schemes, all of that stuff. Any city you go to, they have a lot of stuff now. Um, our crew tend to do that as much as they can. Carpool, use electric cars if you can. It was one of the questions when we were audited last year on uh, ISO 14001, the environmental standard. I was asked if I drove an electric car. Unfortunately, I don't, but it would be a great thing if we could all start to think in that way about doing something different. Uh, use video conferencing, teleconferencing. We know teleconferencing is not always the best and can be difficult, but actually it can save a lot of money and emissions. And then something we do is offset carbon emissions. So not necessarily directly. Yes, we do tree planting and things like that. But then we'll just go and do some volunteering or do some charity work. So somehow you're offsetting that impact that you're having. Okay, so you know, venues do their bit. We eradicate waste by, reducing, by encouraging reuse. We ban plastic. We donate food. Reduce our carbon emissions. We do all of that. But really, what's the business benefit for us? So, pro-environmental practices create positive brand associations. So, for your customers and for you, doing good is actually good in the eyes of others as well. So, it can often raise your profile. It's good for internal team motivation and talent retention. As I said before, I think a lot of the people we have that work for us, you know, this is part of their DNA, the way that we do things, and they want to feel good about what they do. They know that we feel good doing this as a company, so actually want to stay with us. You can also anticipate regulatory trends and position your clients favourably. Be ahead of the game, doing your research, looking at innovations that are coming out. If you're suggesting it to your clients and you make them look good, they love you and they want to stay with you. So it's, it's good business sense. And being innovative often promotes further innovation within a business. So however you act, as well you, know, it, you know, it can be mirrored in others. So actually doing more and more innovation makes you generally more innovative as a team. There are lots of industry awards, as I said before, and of course, ultimately, in our specific event sector, there is the ISO 2012 one, Sustainable Event Management Accreditation. Some of you might look at that and say, actually, that's really hard to get. We, in our supply chain, as advocates, we're always encouraging our suppliers to do their best. Not all of them are going to be going for the accreditation because they might be a freelancer or a two-man band, but... What we do is share the principles with them so they will work towards it. You know, they don't necessarily have the time 
or the money to invest in being accredited, but they follow the principles, so, and that's what we care about. And ultimately, you know, we all want to be advocates, so we want to share that importance of being advocates in this. And, you know, it's taken us 12 years to get to this point because it, it, it hasn't been an easy battle um, and there's still a lot to do. But ultimately, people are now starting, too late, I'd say, but to talk about sustainability and the impact that we're having as a sector. So key takeaways um, from what I've been talking about. Um, I've got a list here. So if you can, set a sustainable policy for your event and set yourself targets of what you want to do. And that, as I said, doesn't have to be changing the world overnight, but just a couple of things that you're going to do differently than you did at the same event last year. Demand more of your venues. Look out for their green credentials, but really push them and ask them questions and make them start to think about what they're doing. Reduce energy use. Demand zero landfill for your event. I mean, that would be an amazing thing to get to as well, but we have to start somewhere. Ban single-use plastics and encourage own, uh, use of own bottles and source it on alternative materials. Go digital wherever you can. I mean, digital, obviously, most of you will know. I'm sure that digital is a big thing now, and people are doing a lot more general day-to-day -day life stuff digitally. We can all do more in the event sector. E-ticketing, badging, don't print, you know, paperless. <coughs> Whatever you can do digital, it's, it's better for the environment, but it also saves you and clients money. <coughs> Push for modular kit and exhibition stands. Reuse leftover materials wherever possible and recycle, recycle, recycle. If you have to go somewhere where you do have some waste, make sure that the venue you're at can deal with that waste and it can go into the recycling chain properly. And if they can't, because not all venues overseas do that, as you'll see from Shanghai, but bring it back with you. Bring it back and put it into your own recycling chain. Use ethical and sustainable suppliers. Source local to minimise carbon footprint. And then, as I said before, offset travel carbon footprint footprint wherever you get. You can calculate it. There are lots of things online where you can actually go and calculate your carbon emissions. Donate leftover food and reward and acknowledge achievements. And I think that last bit is really important to kind of just solidify what your team are doing. And you know, you may need to convince some of your staff that actually this is a good thing. But when they then get the recognition for what they're doing, everybody feels good about it. And at the end of the day, it's good for people, planet and profit. The last thing I'd say on that is do your research, question everything. You know, we need to ask more questions of everybody we work with in our supply, supply chain. Demand more, think differently, and become an advocate for sustainable events. And together, we can do more. <coughs> so just in terms of where we are in the world of sustainability and the damage that we're doing to the environment, so we are behind the curve, no doubt about that. According to the UN, we have 12 years to limit climate change catastrophe not long. Um, a sense of urgency and sustainability is not a luxury and sustainability now is so different from, you know when people are talking about oh let's use some cardboard to build a stand. It's not that anymore. It's everything. People, planet and profit and it's not a luxury. We've got to do something about it. We're not talking about being ahead of the curve anymore. We're talking about how far behind the curve we are and how important it is not to fall even further behind the curve. So why the sense of urgency? Because, as Greenpeace says, there is no planet B. Thank you. Thank you.